All right. So we're going to. Oh, let me uh, share my screen here. So basically, the so the things I'm going to be sharing on the screen, you can watch the stream if you want. If you can't, that's okay. Everything I'm sharing, I posted in the um, the lecture, whatever channel. So it's everything here. So we're going to be starting with the gloss today. Uh, last week we talked about some context, so this week we're talking with we're starting with the actual gloss, and we're going to be going through the Ud Lev gloss, or simply uh, Lev, um, which is a branch of the uh, RDL KDF Kunstdesfechten's um, glosses of Lichtenauer's uh, Zedel. It's my favorite of the glosses, which is why we're going to be going through it, and in my opinion, the best. And we'll get to why later. Um, the differences don't really start, you know, manifesting themselves until later on in the techniques. The basic stuff is all pretty much the same. Okay. So, uh, I don't really want to go through the, um, the first bit, I guess. There's, there's probably some good stuff in there. There's probably some, like, uh, philosophy in there somewhere, but it's unglossed. And I don't want to speculate too much, and I'm not, like, an expert on, uh, you know, how medieval people viewed, uh, loving God and honoring women. So, we'll just skip that for now. If anybody else has any, uh, research on it, we can maybe do something another time. But let's start with the, <clears throat> with the common lessons now, specifically the first one. So, if you want to show art, look left, pass, path right with hewing, and left with right if you wish to strongly fence, fence strongly. The first lesson of the longsword is that before all else you should learn to hew the hues correctly if you otherwise want to fence strongly. And hear it like this, when you stand with the left foot forward and hew from the right side, the hue is false and incorrect if the right side remains behind, therefore the hue will be too short and may not have its correct path to the correct side. Or if you stand with the right foot forward and hew from the left side, if you do not follow after the with the left foot, then the hue is again false. Therefore note, when you hew from the right side, you always follow after with the right foot, and also do the same when you hew from the left side, so that your body is in correct balance with it. In this way, the hues will be hewn long and correct. So, to unpack that, um, so the basic interpretation that I go with for this is that it's mainly advice to uh, take a passing step when you hew. So if you stand with the left foot forward and cut from the right side, then the right side can't remain behind. So you need to take a step forward with the right foot. Um, so additional advice that's kind of... Um, hidden in here is the hue will be too short. So from that we can infer that we don't want to hue short, we want to hue, hue long, we want to have a good reach, so we probably want to extend the arms. And um, it may not have its correct path to uh, the correct side. So we want the hue well, okay, so in um, in Danzig it says the hue ends in front of your opposite foot, the path to the opposite foot. Um, this one, it's maybe not as explicit, but they want the hue to have the path all the way through down the front. And the third one is, or sorry, the fourth piece of advice that's hidden in here is your body is in correct balance with it. So, um, another thing that this step should do for us is keep us in correct balance. So we probably shouldn't be, you know, leaning too far to one side or another when we, um, you know, after we finish. 
so that we can follow up with more attacks or move to a parry or do whatever we have to do. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I'm kind of inserting here that's that's uh, my own inference. But yeah, that's that's the basic idea that I think it's trying to tell us. So um, let's unpack this passing step thing a little bit because at first glance it might seem simple but when you actually try to apply it to fencing it gets a little bit um, it's a little bit less clear it's a little bit more um, you know fuzzy so the first thing I want to kind of start off with is what this is actually talking about and it's a cut we're doing a cut um, and it's a cut that's meant presumably to um, attack the our opponent so we're attacking our opponent with the cut and the other thing I'm gonna presume here is that we expect to hit them and the reason I presume that the reason I uh, am comfortable presuming that is because of um, the later this later advice here that we get hew near and what you want so whenever you want to fence perform it with the strength of your body and hew near to his head so that he must parry um, so to me what that's telling us is that we want to aim for the person and not the sword so now what we're looking at is we're looking at a attack with a cut towards the opponent that is meant to, uh, you know, come in contact with them. So it's not a, a cut that's meant to provoke. It's not a beat or anything to the sword. It's a cut straight to the other person. And we're supposed to do that with a passing step. Um, yeah, so let's first talk. OK, so right. The passing step. The main thing that I want to uh, say about the passing step is it's not it's not a goal. So the passing step is not a goal here. The passing step is a constraint. The goal is to hit our opponent, and that's where we should start when we when we try to work this out. We should start with the goal, which is to um, hit the opponent. Um, but there's also another goal of a cut, which is to cut through an object. So our two goals, two, two um, separate goals here with the cut. Cut through an object and touch the opponent with the sword. So the problem here is that those two goals are in conflict. Um, so you can have, you can, you can imagine a... Um, a spectrum and on one end you have a cut that is purely optimized to cut through a target and on the other end you have a cut that's purely optimized to uh, touch a person to, to, to touch your opponent uh, who's resisting you and trying not to get hit you know they're trying to parry you they're trying to hit you themselves um, you want to you want to reach them with your sword so an example here of cuts of, of optimal cuts to cut through. We have yeah. So there's Watakiri Batosai cutting through seven tatami mats, which anybody who has cut before knows how difficult of a feat that is. Um, so one, so a couple things that we can notice about his cut. He starts from a uh, he starts from this very retracted position. So he has his sword pulled way back, uh, ready to cut. Um, one sec here. He um, so he's creating a, a very large cutting arc here. With, with a sword because because of uh, how retracted it is 
Um, obviously, he has to pay attention to his edge alignment. If his edge alignment is off by a little bit, it won't cut through. Um, he's not. We'll let's see if we can stop it while he's cutting. All right. So <laughs> the uh, the frames aren't fast enough, but you can kind of see he's not cutting with the tip of the sword. He's cutting. You know, he's looking for the sweet spot, which is sometimes closer to the middle than to the tip. Um, he has to cut all the way through, obviously, instead of stopping at his target. He There's no um, explosive or uh, preparatory motion. He just walks directly up and cuts his target, because he doesn't need to. It's not trying to parry him or anything. Um... Yeah, and both of his feet are planted. I think he takes a little, he does a little hop beforehand, kind of, so he can, you know, drop all his weight down. But when he actually makes the cut, his feet are both planted on the ground, and he's using his entire body to um, to, to perform the cut. Um, so on the other end of the spectrum, the the touching end, the example that I use is saber fencing. Modern Saber. So in Saber, you have a very light weapon, and the entire blade is electrified. So, and you're wearing like a uh, an, a metal mesh jacket. Um, the torso and your arms are all a target. So anything on the blade of the sword that touches the target in any way will give you a point. So. You know, you kind of eliminate any of that necessity to have a good cut at all. And you're purely just trying to reach the target. You know, a very good target who's, who's uh, you know, trying to do all the things that, that you can do. But still. So you can see there's lots of, you know, there's, there's forward explosive movement. There's a lot of preparatory actions, so a lot of movements to, you know, deceive or, or like find an opening on your opponent. Um, they don't care about edge alignment at all. Uh, they don't. <laughs> obviously, the feet aren't on the ground in most of these. Uh, this is specifically a flunge compilation, which is kind of like a uh, a fake move in saber because they can't uh, cross their legs, but. Um, you know, clearly when they hit, their feet are not planted on the ground. Uh, which means that they're not optimally transferring their force into their pump. So you can see a big difference between these two uh, types of, of uh, attacks slash cuts. And... Uh, I guess kind of the the conflict that we have to resolve. So we as as uh, longsword fencers, we kind of have to find where on that spectrum we want to land with our with what we do. And you know, I kind of think, in my opinion, it should uh, it should land somewhere in the middle. I think that we should have some arc with our cut. We should cut with the edge and not the flat. Um, but at the same time, I don't think we need to, you know, walk, ha like, have both feet planted and transfer all of our force into the, into the cut and, you know, make it ha have like a perfect, you know, um, cutting mechanics cut every time. I think there's a little bit of comprom compromise to be made there. So, um, you can, uh, so th th there's a little bit of, uh, background on, on what, like, the goals of the, the, uh, of our cutting attack should be. So, the third thing, so we have cutting to, um, cutting to cut, we have, uh, cutting to touch, and then the third thing we need to take into account 
is the source that we read. <clears throat> so the four things are uh, cut with a passing step, cut long, uh, body in balance, and uh, sword has its path downward in front of the opposite foot. So when we're fencing, we can eliminate the fourth one, which is sword down to the uh, opposite foot, because um, because of the nature of fencing, we don't want to actually, you know, we can't actually cut through each other. So we have to stop at the target. Um, and if we don't want to hurt the person, then we won't try to cut through anyway. We'll just try to cut to the target. So that one we kind of can, you know, give it a pass. Say, you know, if we assume that we were, we assume that if we were fencing with sharps, then we would continue down to the ground. But we can kind of just hand wave that one. Um, body and correct balance. So that's something that we're going to have to remember when we get to the ending point of the cut. Um, hewing long and correct. Um, so long is is kind of a, uh, we're kind of lucky there because in both of the uh, on both ends of the spectrum, whether you're cutting to cut or you're cutting to uh, touch your opponent. Extending your arms out is an important aspect of both of those because you want to extend to reach and when you're cutting you want to um, extend as much as possible so you have maximum tip velocity on your sword. So good. We can conclude that whatever cut we do it should probably be extended. It should probably be in the ex extended position. Um, and the final one is hue with a passing step. And this is where things get complicated. Um, so, let's see, ideal cutting, ideal attacking, about passing steps. Okay, so I have this little anatomy of the passing step um, thing that I made a while ago. And this is not, this is a little bit outdated, but I didn't, uh, I didn't want to change it too much. So, when we're doing a passing step, the one thing that, or the first thing that we have to remember about doing a passing step is that they take a long time. So, from the start of your step, when you push off with either your back foot or your front foot, to the time your foot lands, is generally longer it's a it's a longer period of time than it takes for your opponent to be able to react to whatever you're doing and parry your cut. Um, and that amount of time, uh, we've so me and me and some people from the Hema Discord have been doing some experiments with um, timing cuts and stuff and and timing attacks, and we've come to um, a somewhat arbitrary but but uh, kind of realistic number of uh, 350 milliseconds for an attack. So um, using, this ben using this benchmark, any attack that comes in before 350 milliseconds has a chance of hitting. Anything coming in above that um, will probably be parried um, because of the uh, you know human reaction time. Um, and it, you know it'll vary. It'll vary uh, based on the person. It'll vary based on like who's hitting and uh, who's receiving, and all that good stuff. But as a general benchmark, we're going to use uh, 350 milliseconds. So time distance. Right, so, oh, does anybody have any uh, questions so far? I've, I kind of uh, have been rambling and hopefully everybody's getting it, but we should just be getting into the juicy part now. But if anybody has any qu questions or comments or anything,
Okay, so we'll talk about the phases of the step here, first of all. So you have two feet, obviously. Um, so we're gonna we're going to term them the dominant foot and the non-dominant foot because you can't say front and back because front and back switch halfway through the step. So dominant foot is the foot that's associated with your dominant hand. It might actually be your other foot, but for our purposes, we're going to say it's the foot is the foot uh, corresponding to your dominant hand. Um, so for a right-hander, it's your right foot. For a left-hander, it's your left foot. Um, Non-dominant foot, obviously, is the other foot. So we want to, as we're, as we're told in the gloss, we want to start with our left foot forward if we're hewing from the right side. <clears throat> um, and later in the other common lesson, they tell us to hew from our strong side. Don't fence left if you're right. So I'm a right-hander, so I'm going to start with my left foot forward and I'm going to be cutting from my right side as my default cut. So I got my left foot forward. So the first, we start in our starting position and we separate the uh, sorry, we separate the step into the weight shift phase and the recovery phase. So the weight shift phase is after I push off from either from my back foot or my front foot, um, there's going to be some time uh, before my back foot passes my front foot while I'm shifting my weight onto my front foot. Um, and then after that is the recovery phase, and that is when I'm moving my, um, my formerly back foot um, into its position in my front foot or in, in front so I don't fall over. Um, so, you know, a step is just like a, you know, you're falling over, you're falling forward, but you catch yourself with your foot. So the recovery phase is the phase where you're catching yourself. And then of course you have the ending position where both feet are planted. Um, transitory position, um, just any position between the starting position and the ending position. So transitory position is when you're basically standing on one foot. Um, let's see. Step. Right, so let's talk about this. So you can you can power the step either with your back foot or your front foot. Um, and how you do either of those um, kind of depends on your initial stance. So I have so we have what I call the upright posture and the um, the sprinter's posture. So the upright posture is you know obviously upright. Um, your back is straight. Your uh, your your front knee is generally over your. Uh, your front heel. So you kind of have the freedom of moving in any direction that you want. And this is the stance that we usually stand in when we're fencing, um, whether we realize it or not, because we want to be able to move around. Uh, we usually stand in an upright posture. Um, the other one is, I'll, I'll call the sprinter's posture, which gets its name from the uh, you know, here's an example of the 40 yard dash uh, three point start posture. So you can see the front knee is well forward of the of the uh, front toes. Both heels are raised, raised off the ground. Um, here you can see two uh, fencers in that posture. This is kind of more, the right is kind of a more extreme version than the left. Um, and what this do, does is it allows you to um, you're, you're kind of already committed forward 
so it allows you to explosively jump off of uh, both of the legs, so including the front leg. Um, if you're in an upright posture, it's uh, because your weight is kind of in the middle over both legs, you can't really push off of the, or you can't, um, the, the front foot can't be involved in the initial explosive movement of the cut. Um, of this step. So if you're in the sprinter's posture, it can be. Obviously the trade-off is if you're in the sprinter's posture, you're already committed forward. So you don't have very much freedom of movement. So that's why we don't really uh, stand in this position when we're, when we're fencing. Even though it would, it would uh, shave a little bit, it does shave a little bit of time off of the cut. Uh, because you don't have to, you, you have less, uh, you, your, your body has less of a job to do to, to move your, you forward. So, where do we go from here? Okay, I want to talk about timing. Clay power and front foot power and other types of foot switch. I don't want to talk about that stuff right now. Um, here we go. Okay, so timing the cut with the step. So we see these these phases here of the step. So when do we add our cut into the step? Well, you can add it really in any of these in in any time during this uh, this process. You can do the cut cut. So you can throw it during the weight shift phase, you can throw it before the weight shift phase, you can throw it during the recovery phase, or you can throw it after you're already in your ending position. And each one of those uh, types of timings has its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, the one that I want to focus on the most, however, is um, during the weight shift phase. Um, actually, I have a, uh, right, so here's um, Dustin Reagan demonstrating different timings or different ways that you can time a cut with a, uh, with a step here. So let me start that over. So before, concordant as you land, after your foot lands, and then adding a uh, preparation step to it. So, the one that I want to focus on is, as I mentioned, during the weight shift phase. Um, if you do it before the weight shift phase, you're kind of just hitting without taking a step at all. Um, you need to be in kind of close distance, but it's good for if you're doing a counterattack, like if your opponent is closing distance for you and you just you know, hit without taking any any step at all, or for like hand sniping and stuff. But during the weight shift phase is really where the uh, the cool stuff happens. So, getting back to the ability to uh, touch our opponent with our sword, to, to reach our opponent, and that uh, 350 millisecond benchmark that I mentioned. Um, in order to stay below that uh, that benchmark, the cut really has to take place in this time because the full step from from the foot leaving the ground to the foot landing it's just too much time. So the, the cut needs to take place in here. Um, so the, the consequence of that is you can't use the full distance of the passing step. So you, you kind of, um, you know, if, if you're thinking about a passing step, one of the advantages you might be uh, considering for it is that it covers a lot of distance, which is true. It covers more distance than a lunge because uh, when you're lunging, your, you know, your rear foot is, is the limiting factor because you're, you're planting your rear foot. When you're doing a uh, passing step, your front foot is the limiting factor because you're pivoting on the front foot. 
Um, so you do cover a lot more distance with a passing step, but you can't use all that distance to, um, you know, as, as reach for your cut because it'll be too slow. It'll just get tired every time. And this is why I've been teaching you guys wrong for the past several years because I, uh, I've always taught it as landing the cut and, you know, the, the, um, the, the cut lands as your foot lands. And it's, you know, sometimes maybe you can make that work, but by and large, you need to land the cut before your front foot lands. So while you're, while you're, sorry, yeah, your non-dominant foot, no, your dominant foot, right? The one that wasn't back. You need to land the cut before that lands. Um, so, how do we accomplish that? Um, well, let's see some videos. So here's um, Anton Kahutovich way back in uh, 2013 with his... So you can see there's a, uh, a push off of his back foot and because uh, his front knee is bent, he can also, you know, add power with his front foot. The cut lands just as his back foot is leave leaving the ground. So he has this forward lean. So um, he, does, he does get a little bit of uh, distance boost from, from this attack. And then his foot lands. Um, you know, he, he doesn't have the sword extended anymore, but his, his his point would be well past his opponent if he landed the cut here. Um, let's look at this one. So this one, um, this guy, he starts in a more extreme sprinter's posture. So his his body is hinged. So Note that his back is still straight. Um, it's just hinged at the hip, hinged forward at the hip. So he's not he's not hunching over. He's not um, he's not breaking his posture. He's just committing himself forward early, and you can see the knee is you know over the toes. So he can really use both of his legs in his uh, to gain power with the step. So here. If YouTube works. So you can see, um, luckily he's wearing shorts, so you can see both of his um, calf muscles are engaged here. So he's pushing off with both feet. And as a uh, kind of a consequence of uh, the fact that his upper body is already so forward engaged, he doesn't need to take that extra leaning forward with the cut. Um, so his, uh, his back foot kind of makes it further with the cut than Anton's does. So remember Anton's, when he was making contact, his foot was just leaving the ground. But with him, his foot is already almost past the front foot. And that's because his upper body was already engaged. And you can also see that his total step is a little bit further so, um, you know, in order to recover and regain his posture, he needs to really kick out with this back foot when he recovers. So we can see a couple other ones. So he's stepping, you know, look how, look how close his, his foot is to, to the target now. He's basically, um, you know, in either slicing or grappling range already. Um, so here we can see, uh, maybe you've watched this video already, but you can see the progression. So you can kind of, uh, form a natural progression from just, uh, hitting in distance to the, uh, the passing step, the passing step attack. 
So the more you step back, the more you have to lean forward, and the more off balance you become until you finally have to take a step of it. So the important thing to note about this step is that um, earlier we talked about goals and how uh, doing a passing step is not a goal but a constraint. So here we kind of see uh, the consequence of that. If we take the passing step as a goal, then we're kind of working backwards. Um, we have a solution in search of a problem. So we may end up, you know, uh, trying to land our cut with our foot every time, or, you know, trying to use it to cover distance and, you know, just get parried every single time. But if you, you know, go, if you, um, if you go more goal oriented and um, you know have the have the cut or have the step as a constraint now the step is happening um, in service of of your attack so I'm not I'm not consciously like uh, you know when I attack I'm not I'm not consciously saying like okay I'm gonna do a passing step here I'm just trying to get my sword to my to its target uh, by moving my upper body forward and as a consequence of that I have to take a step so in, instead of the attack having or happening um, in service of the step the step is happening in service of the attack which is a how it should be uh, I feel um, and it allows us to uh, integrate this into our game because you know, it's it's fast enough that we can actually hit people with it. Um, so I'll mention the false step and the half step real quick. So basically, um, I guess as um, the Dustin Reagan video kind of showed this, but you can attach a uh, preamp, like a preparatory step to your, to your cut. And what this does is a few things. It closes the distance a little bit to your opponent. It builds momentum so you can uh, better push off with the, the rear foot and, um, you know, get your hit. And it also allows you to enter distance uh, without too much commitment. So if I, you know, if I push forward with this step and I decide that it's not time yet, I can always pull back. I haven't committed myself yet. Um, so another thing that you can use this for is the false step, um, as I've been terming it, which is where you step forward and then you leave your weight forward, but you bring your foot back. So, so what this does is it kind of puts you in, um, when you're in a fencing position, it, it puts you in more of a uh, sprinter's posture, which allows you to integrate that, that front foot, um, you know, the front leg into your explosive movement. Um, you know, again, the cost of that is once you do that false step and you leave your weight forward, you're committed, but you do that, get that explosive attack from it. Um, so yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> the attacking, where's my anatomy? The attacking during the weight shift phase, we have come to term the uh, ballistic passing step. Uh, the reason it's ballistic is not because, you know, it's uncontrolled or like a super explosive step, um, but because because you're doing the cut in the first half of it, uh, when you land the cut, your body is still in a ballistic trajectory and you must, you know, recover from that. So another thing that I mentioned is 
Okay, so let's let's talk about um, what you do with the rest of the step when you're not like after the cut is done. So I mentioned that it, it does cover more distance and as a result, so you can see here I'm further away and after I finish my step um, we're you know at this distance so you can kind of look at the, the house in the background so right now I'm lined up with that window in the house whereas when I was doing my initial cuts Facebook or if, uh, YouTube loads here right so you see when I'm when I'm uh, reaching at maximum extension there's the window I was lined up with before I'm a little back further so this will bring you into a closer distance than um, you know a maximum like distance hit will which means you need to be prepared uh, for a follow-up um, and in order to do that, um, you should, well, you can run through in like a flesh motion. You can keep running forward and then grapple or, you know, run past the person. Um, but I guess kind of the more uh, by the book way to do it, because we want to be in balance with this, would be to land firm footed in kind of a uh, lunge posture. So we're yeah. So in more of a lunge posture, and um, you can kind of straighten out your back. And what you can do is, um, after you've made the hit, as you're recovering with your with your uh, uh, dominant foot moving forward, use that time to prepare your next action. So what you can do is, you know, maybe your attack gets parried and your opponent likes to repost. So you can use that motion to uh, prepare a parry, to uh, parry their repost. Or you can use that time to uh, feel what your opponent's doing, which is the more, you know, the more uh, KDF way to do it. So like fooling and dust, we want to feel and uh, choose the best action. So while you're uh, while you're landing, if you assess if you've been parried. If you have, then start to make the decision of what to do next. And hopefully by the time your foot lands, you should be ready with your next action. Um, so a lot of times you can you know, you'll be fighting somebody and you can get an idea of what kind of repost they like to do after they parry you. Like, you know, cutting around to the left side is a, is a pretty common one. So something I'll do uh, pretty often is do my ballistic cut. Um, as soon as I realize it's been parried, I'll go into my block. And that way, by the time my foot lands, I'm already parrying and I can do my... Uh, you know, my counter parry repost against them. Um, so let's just uh, briefly talk about other types of timings. They, I, I really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going all in on the uh, ballistic passing step right now. I think it's, it's the, uh, the best thing ever. But uh, there are other, you know, timings that you can use. So if you cut during the recovery phase, then what you have, you have the opposite situation. So in the ballistic passing step, you have your cut in the first part, and then you do an action in the second part to, uh, you know, to recover. In this one, um, you have all this time in the beginning, and what you can do is do an action during that time. So you can do like some kind of covering action, you can do a feint, you can do a beat, you know, any kind of preparatory action to uh, create an opening you can do during that time. Um, if you don't 
do a, a preparatory action during that time. Um, what you can do is what I've been thinking of as a uh, distance trap. So sometimes um, you'll be fencing somebody and they'll kind of get a feel for you know what distance you can hit them at and uh, you know where they're safe and and where they're in the danger zone I guess you could say and so what you can do is after after giving them that sense you can start an attack push in start your passing step and then don't do the ballistic step but but keep passing through and they'll step back or they'll do some kind of parry or whatever and then they'll realize that you haven't hit them and they'll they'll think they're at safe distance and let their guard down but you just you know maybe uh, kick a little bit extra with your with your um, left foot and get a little bit more distance and hit them as as your foot lands and you'll you know you'll catch up to them even though they thought that they're out of distance so that's I call that the distance trap um, so yeah that's uh, that's pretty much my uh, my spiel on the um, the ballistic passing step and cutting with a passing step in general so it's uh, something that seems simple on the surface but once you actually start to try to apply it, it gets a little bit more complicated um, so the main the main uh, takeaway here should be um, when, when you're looking for how to do something or the uses of an action start with the goal that you're trying to accomplish and work from there rather than uh, starting with a solution in search of a problem. Um, wow, I just talked for like an hour straight. Does anybody have any questions? None at the moment. Does that make sense? Did I lose anybody? It makes sense. Can you hear me, by the way? Yes, I can hear you, Steve. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I I would like to offer a comment if I could. Go ahead. Uh, the things that you're the things that you're discussing um, right now uh, about the ballistic passing step and its effectiveness. Um, th like I I've seen that uh, I've seen that hard at work uh, in some people's fighting, and I kind of. Well, I, I won't call it a habit, but I've kind of fallen into doing that. And um, I, I think uh, I, I was in a pattern at a certain point in my training where I was focusing so much on hitting the target and a little less uh, focus was being put on what my foot was doing while I was executing the passing step. And I eventually found, found myself connecting uh, with the target without actually having the foot land. Uh, the... Um, I found that my blade, assuming I wasn't parried, was hitting what I was aiming at. Um, yeah, but before uh, before my dominant foot landed. So I think it's kind of it's pretty interesting hearing all of this now. Um, yes. Also, um, I find that if you uh, uh, if you use the ballistic passing step, at least this has been the case with me anyway. If I use it and um, I'm parried. It kind of takes a little, um, uh, a slight bit of extra time to kind of like ready myself for the next action. Uh, it seems that um, I don't know if I'm doing this right, but when I when I execute uh, a ballistic passing step, it's I am fully committed. So uh, it takes uh, it takes a moment, as I said, to like settle myself and like regain my balance. Uh, do you have any uh, advice as far as how I can do that with more stability when landing? Um, I would say practice doing them on your pel. That's what I've been practicing a lot lately. So practice, you know, doing your uh, passing step attack, and then, you know, when you're land, when you land, try to like regain your posture 
as quickly as possible. And maybe like uh, try to envision your Pell um, ready to hit you back. And then do like a parry of an imaginary attack or something. Or, you know, imag an imaginary bind of some kind. So, um, yeah, I mean, one, one thing that's, you know, it's effective, but maybe we want to avoid if we want to uh, do good KDF fencing is um, having, you know, automatic follow-ups. Because in KDF, we kind of, well, we'll get to this later with, like, Fulin and Indus, but we kind of want to, um, you know, choose our follow-up based on what is the best option rather than having um, automatic follow-ups. But so, in other words, in other words, w eyes wide open fencing. Yeah, yeah. You want to, yeah. Mm -hmm. I right. take it. Um, so yeah, w once you land, like regain your posture and imagine, like, imagine just d doing like the next motion and like vary vary the motions and you know. So like for example, I'll I'll like. Um, I'll do my my attack and and I'll hit my uh, my my practice target, which is a, uh, a a fencing mask hanging from a tree. Um, I'll hit the mask and then I'll like pull back just a little bit, so like hit and then you know gain good posture and then move to like whatever parry or like practice doing like your mutarian or duplirian or whatever. Um, so, and if you can, like, if you can do your follow-up and, like, vary it, then you, you should have a good sense that you're keeping, um, you know, you're landing in good balance. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, uh, um, that's, that's one thing I would like to do, um, is, uh, sort of, like, keep my, uh, keep my back straight and, um, pull my hands back in just a bit. So I'm ready for what comes next. I feel yeah. like uh, if if um, if I execute a cut using that step, uh, and it gets parried, I do want to you know I do want to sort of um, get out of that fully extended position. Yeah. So I could be ready for a cut that comes at you know um, my uh, you know my head or um, uh, some other part of my body that I could more easily defend if I'm not, you know, if I don't have my hands um, yeah. fully, uh, fully reached out. Right. I've, I've been kind of uh, trying to come up with a name for it. Um, you know, after you hit, you can, you know, obviously when you hit, your arms are fully extended. And then once you land, what I do is like bend my hands, bend my elbows a little bit. And bring my tip up a little bit, so my sword's kind of at like a forty-five degree or like a sixty-degree angle or so. And I kind of so it's that. kind of like a, a defense. Yeah. So it it's like it's it's like an assessment position though, because I want to you know I want to feel and assess what my opponent's doing. Um. But uh, yeah, and I mean from there it's pretty easy to parry in any direction if you have to. Um, or you can do a blade action. But you're just taking like a, a half of a beat to assess what's going on. I want to actually address the first thing you said, which is that you found yourself um, doing these types of steps um, on your own. And I want to say that a lot of people do do them. Um, anybody who actually, well, okay, so if you look at tournament footage, attacking with a passing step, um, unless it's like a flesh, with like starting with dominant foot forward, um, attacking with a passing step like we're talking about is very rare. Uh, people don't do it very often. But when they do, it's a ballistic step. Um, so nobody really, like as far as I know, nobody really teaches these. But if they do passing step attacks, they do the this type of attack. Um, the, because either they, they figured it out themselves, or, you know, 
whatever the reason may be, or they, you know, they think they're doing one thing, but they're doing another. And I mean, like, I use myself as an example, because, like, you know, anybody who's been to our class knows how, like, I teach the passing step attack, or have his historically taught it. I've always taught it with, like, you know, hitting and landing the foot at the same time. But, you know, I look at old, you know, sparring footage of myself and, like, tournament footage, and I was using ballistic passing steps, but, you know, I didn't have, I didn't know, like, I didn't understand them. I didn't understand how to categorize them or, like, what the difference was or what I was doing. So, um, I think somebody, John asked a question, um, the passing step, do you make it as linear as possible? Um, so, well, I mean, everything has to be, like, once you're committed to a direction, you're going in that direction. Um, You know, for the for the basic attack, what I have in mind is a is a straight moving straight forward attack. But you can do these in different directions. You can spring to like a diagonal or a side or something. Um, I'm usually like when you're when you're making an attack. My default position is you should probably go straight in because that gives you the maximum reach. You lose a lot of distance. Like, for... When, when you're, um... When you're stepping offline or stepping to the side, you... Like... I can't... I can't come up with the words that I'm looking for, but, like, there's, there's a, um... Like, the... the for, for making very small angle adjustments, you lose a large amount of distance, is what I'm going to say. So, yeah, if, if, if you follow the trajectory out, the difference is, is greater at, right. uh, at what's supposed to be the point of impact than it was from the start. Yes, yeah. And the further you are from the other person, the more pronounced it is. Um, so you're, if you're at fencing distance and you're trying to attack someone diagonally, then it's going to be tough to reach them. However, when you are in distance, when you've already made an attack and you're in close distance, because you're close to somebody now, um, like, going at a different angle will get you a lot more benefit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, once we get to more attacks where they where the uh, sources suggest stepping offline. We can talk more about that. But in general, um, except for the crump to the hands, but the crump is the exception to pretty much every uh, rule anyway. Every time we're told to step to the side, it's always when our opponent is attacking us and we're doing a counterattack against us, against them. Which makes sense because they're closing the distance for us. So, in conclusion, if you're just attacking somebody, um, I say going straight in is better. I mean, not to mention that if you try and go in at an angle, can't they just simply turn? And then um, stepping off to the side as an attack is just pointless anyways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's people who just, like, stand at distance and just, like, circle around and around without doing any attack and I think that that's I think that should be banned from tournaments because <laughs> all that does is pisses off the judge can I say something about uh, practicing the uh, ballistic step mm -hmm. so I actually think there's value in um, like when you practice it, removing the sword from the equation and just doing the step, because that can help you um, like focus on the landing. And um, so that, that can be beneficial for when you're using the sword and you're trying to recover faster. So if you isolate um, and just do the foot movement, uh, you can really just focus on that.
Yeah, that's that's good advice. I've been thinking of other possible advice to give people trying these for the first time. Um, Adrian said that he would rather have people um, run through than land firm-footed when they're first learning them because it could be hard on your knee to, la to land that hard. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind. One thing I kind of had in mind, and I haven't, I haven't had the chance to um, test this on anybody who's learning it yet, but I was practicing it myself, is just have either, I mean, you can have your sword or not, and just extend it out fully in front of you and kind of act like it's pulling you straight forward. So you're, you have to lean and lean and lean and until you can't lean anymore and then you have to catch yourself with your other foot. So maybe that's, that's how I've, that's how, how I've always pictured this being performed. Yeah. 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 I think the uh, landing is definitely one of the bigger concerns about teaching this to somebody who's like hasn't done it before because uh you get a lot of knee collapsing in people who like don't do lunges so yeah yeah, yeah and i guess uh, uh beginners also tend to um point their toes in when they land so their their uh knee is not lined up with the direction that they're stepping so i guess that's something that we would need to look out for as well. Um, I mean, the footwork, the passing step foot is straight like a fencer as opposed to, say, wrestling. The passing step foot. Um, so the foot... Well, the front foot is always pointed forward, of course. The back foot... Um, it can be either way. It can be pointed forward or pointed off to the side. Usually when I'm in long point, my back foot will be pointed forward. Um, oh, like circling. I, yeah. I, I'm sorry, John. I don't really know what you're asking. Passing step foot is straight like a fencer as opposed to say wrestling, like circling. Sorry, I don't I don't really know what you're uh, what you're asking there. Okay. So yeah, um, in conclusion, I think we should see more people, um, I would like to see more people, um, attacking with passing steps in, in the future, and especially people who claim to do KDF. People who claim to do KDF shouldn't be fencing right foot forward. So that's the, that's the, um, the first step really into integrating passing steps into your game is to um, get in the habit of fencing non-dominant foot forward. Because if you're fencing dominant foot forward then you, there's just no like there's no chance that you're going to be doing passing steps except for flushes. If you if you fence right uh, dominant foot forward you are you know you're on your way to Epe with Sparehouse. Which is very effective, but I want to see people fencing by the book and fencing effectively by the book. Use these. See, that's the that, that's the real beauty of the ballistic passing step, is because it's historical and it works. So you can you can fence by the book and still win matches. Isn't that crazy? Glorious.
So I think that's going to wrap up the passing step stuff. If anybody has any uh, questions about it or anything else, we can kind of uh, open up the, the floor to anything you want to talk about since we're all here and we all like swords. I guess I have one small question. Oh, whoever wanted to go can go. Go ahead. All right. Um, I guess this is kind of a strange question about the ballistic passing step, but um, when we look at some of the few illustrated sources we have of KDF, can we tell if any of them are actually attempting to do a ballistic passing step in some of the images? Um, so I mean, I'm assuming not, but I don't know. Yeah, the, the problem with the images is that they either they generally either uh, depict the beginning of a, a movement or the end, so they don't really show the middle part. So, you know, for example, for pictures where it says that the fencers are doing an overhaul, it'll either show both fencers with their sword back like this, or it'll show both fencers already in a bind. And to, in order to tell if they're doing a ballistic passing step, we would need like a middle picture because we would need to see where their foot is as they're cutting. So unfortunately it's not easy to um, you know see. I think Adrian somebody should have sorry, I, I think um, Adrian thinks that there's evidence for the ballistic passing step in Fiore's pictures, but I will um, I'll leave that to him because I um, don't study Fiore. Go ahead, Steve. Somebody should have made a flip book for KDF. <laughs> that would be something. <laughs> a medieval flip book. Uh, did you... Uh, so I was only here for like the tail end of this. Did you cover um, like the non-dominant light position during the um, like transit, like transitory position, basically? Because um, there's a couple of variants on that. I did not cover that. So either, okay. like the bent or the straight version? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the the front foot, like the, the heel lifted or the heel planted versus like the um, like leg straight versus leg bent. Yeah. Um, I think that relates to how much you're engaging the, the front foot in the cut. Would you agree with that? So the more yeah, I also think that it depends like on what your like goal is. I think because the one with the straight leg actually kind of shortens your range a little bit, but you get a more like I guess um, like strong bind if you get parried because you're kind of like like straight. Yeah. I think that's what Talaga was uh, like working on. Were, were you here when I was talking about the um, upright stance versus the sprinter's stance? I was not. Okay, so I'll just I'll I'll show that. I'll show you that real quick. So this is um, oh this is a cool chart that I didn't show, but I don't know it's kind of complicated. I think it might be overcomplicated. So. Um, so I've I've, uh, I've one of the terms that I've coined lately are the upright posture and the um, and the sprinter's posture. So upright yeah. I, I think would be your your straight legged version, and sprinters would be your bent leg. So you know you have yourself committed forward and you can engage the the front leg in the actual uh, cut. Whereas an upright you have to either pass through sprinters in order to engage the front leg, or you just um, you mainly engage the back leg in the cut. Is yeah, the, the, the that, that, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah, I like that. Um, I think you, in particular, um, you're kind of... When you do the ballistic passing step, you're actually... You're not as, like, bent or, like... Um, mm -hmm. Like... Uh, ball loaded as like Anton is but you're not like um completely planted like uh Talaga is so there's like yeah. a big like spectrum that you can be on honestly just like whatever feels good <laughs> yeah I usually when I do it um 
and a lot of it's not conscious, but based on the the video of myself that I've watched, um, I, you know, obviously I start from an upright posture, and I usually do it with a half step, um, with a half step preparation. So, I would expect most of uh, most of the the, uh, or I'm mostly driving from my back foot when I do it. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I guess I should uh, I should put something in my write up about the the plant foot. I guess we can call it. Yeah, I I think it's like not particularly important, but it's like there's differences depending on how you do it in your step. Right. With like range and structure. Yeah. And also how easy it is to recover. If you do it with a straight leg, it's a lot easier to recover. But it's also a lot shorter. Yeah, but if you're hitting in the ballistic, you know, if you're, if you're hitting in the ballistic timing, then it doesn't, uh, well, I guess it still matters. It matters. Yeah, because your body's more forward if your body, if your leg is bad. Right, yeah. Cool. So how much snow did you guys get? Probably the same as me, because we all live in basically the same area. I haven't been brave enough to look out the window yet. It's still snowing where I am, and there's got to be... It was probably around four or five inches on the ground. Yeah, four or five inches, roughly. Nice. Might go practice my ballistic passing steps tomorrow in the snow. In the snow. <laughs> Terrain passing step. Yes. Yeah, so this uh, is when, when we start up class again, this is what we're going to be teaching. This is how we're going to be doing it. You know, if you do judo, you should totally do um, break falls in the snow. It's great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I haven't been able to do break falls at all because everything's so hard, but then I went to the snow. It was great. Nice. Oh, yeah, I never thought of doing that. It's better than the crash pad. Ooh, that's a that's a um a big claim. I'm afraid of my uh my backyard though, it's so uneven. I don't wanna like land on a frozen spike <laughs> in my ground. Oh. <laughs> yeah, just break fall straight into a hidden rock. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to go back to judo. Maybe. Yeah, it's a maybe for me, too. I, I, probably like 70% yes, 30% no. Yeah, the more I think about my judo club, the more I don't like it. The more I don't want to go back. <laughs> but I do want to do judo. Why do you just hate people that are there? <laughs> Can you hear me? Just make the drive to my club. <laughs> I might do that. I think I, he's um the coach is doing a close uh, one further up to north uh, of Philly. So it's there's one in like North Philly and one in like uh, Center City. Sweet. What's wrong with judo club? Oh. Um, what's wrong with my judo club? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, it's, it's a small club and there's multiple instructors and they, I'm recording this, so I don't really want to. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> so I think we understand. Um, <clears throat> but I do like judo, and they're friendly. They're they're uh, they're good people. All right. But well, you, John, you um, you kind of came, but but you left before we actually started. But you came to the gym. 
that one time. Yeah, well, I think I saw. Yeah, I think I saw you guys there. I was yeah. doing everything almost. No, I don't remember. If, uh, uh, you guys did everything, but yeah, I was there. Yeah. I remember seeing at least the warm up. I'm going to turn off the recording now.